based on what Tammy had said and what uh, John responded to, I can remember uh, when I got off a plane in Vietnam, first time I'd ever been outside of the United States. What a weird, eerie feeling it was. Even though I was around people that I knew, other uh, men in the military, but the culture, the geography, the people, everything was totally alien. And I think what's happening with the church, what God spoke to me early this morning, is that we're just beginning to really understand that we are not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We have tried to uh, integrate into this world in all, for all of our lives because we thought that's what we were supposed to do. But there's always been a part of us that has felt uncomfortable with it. No matter how much we're succeeding in other areas, there's always something that seems to be left undone. And that's because we're not of this world. We're just in it. We're here not unlike the military was in Vietnam. I'm not saying we can equate the, all the good that was uh, happening in the earth uh, to the evil that took place over there. But we were there with a purpose. And at least the intention was that we would bring freedom. We'd bring understanding of a, of a better way of life. And that's the reason why we're here. And I'm saying this not to frighten anybody or to freak anybody out, but it's time that we grow up and realize there's something very evil, very wicked, something that we haven't ever even dreamed could be happening. But it is happening, and it has been happening for a long time. And the fact that the church is ignorant of it and has been ignorant of it speaks to the fact that we have not been tuned in to God in the way we should have been. So that the more things uh, begin to unfold, the more frightening it may seem to be. But remember, the only thing being frightened is your natural man. Your inward man knows all this junk anyway and has known it all along. So don't let fear intimidate you. And let me say this, everybody in this room Suzanne's already said it. Tammy said it. Every one of you is a prophet. Yes. Every one of you is a seer. Every one of you has the same potential of gifting as anybody you've ever heard or anybody you've ever seen. And it's time in this last day that we don't make the mistakes of the earlier church. And that is to identify this group, that group, this person, that person, and miss God. We need every active member actively activated in order to accomplish what God wants to accomplish. That doesn't mean there, there aren't offices that will operate and that will function and that will uh, empower and enable people. Identify what they have to use. But it's going to take every member of this church to do what God wants done in this last day. Now, it's going to get done. It's just a question of who's going to do it. And what the enemy wants to do is put us into a state of fear and anxiety to where we hunker down. This is what's been going on for the last two years, is to get everybody isolated and separated so that you can uh, just let the enemy run wild in your mind and not focus on what God's intentions are for us in this last day. We're in the last days. What does that mean? It could mean that Jesus is coming today. It could mean he doesn't come for another hundred years. Nobody knows this except the Lord himself. But we are to live as though he could come right now and occupy as though he may not come for another generation or two. So let's live in anticipation. If things get totally sideways, God's still in charge. Yes. 
I, I preached a funeral just a couple of weeks ago, and that's one of the things the Lord put on my heart to say, and that was, what's the, look, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? You die. What's the best thing that can happen to us as Christians? We die. Now, I know because of the way that we think, because we're natural-minded in so many ways, we're still equating all this with fear and dread and what's going to happen. I'm telling you what's going to happen. Something so wonderful, you cannot imagine it. And all we can think about is what we'll leave behind. You ain't leaving nothing behind. If we left, if I dropped over dead right here, right now, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not asking for that. God knows my heart. Yeah. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. I want to see them marry and have children of their own, and I want to see all of that. But if I don't, there's something even better than that anticipation waiting for me Amen. on the other side. And I'm only going to be separated from them on my side for less than a blink of an eye. There is no time where we're going to end up going. And I'll be with them all again. In a place so pristine, so pure, so beautiful. That only then can we understand the, the, the weight and the heaviness and the angst that we live in today. We can have the best that we can possibly have here. And step into the other realm and find out it was the basis. It was like being stuck in a mud hole somewhere. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Praise God. Everything's going backwards this time, so if uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we normally do now at the end of the service. Praise the Lord. Because I'm just going to go to the Word of God. I was... We had grandkids uh, last night, yesterday and last night, but um, I was still awake because I slept out in the living room with, the, with two of them, the boys, and uh, I'm still asleep over, praise the Lord, uh, but I was still awake at 4 o'clock this morning. And uh, thank you, honey. Uh, I've been knowing some stuff. <laughs> That's my uh, time I spent in Texas here. I've been knowing uh, some things for a while. And I, I'm, that's not, my intention is not to share that, all of that with you this morning. That will come out by itself. And that's one of the things the Lord told me today because I was tempted to say everything that's in my mind and in my spirit. And the Lord said he would tell me when that time came. And I was, that's why I was kind of wandering around here this morning like I didn't know where I belonged. Because whether or not I was going to go ahead and do it anyway or just trust the Lord. But suffice it to say that... Uh, There has never been a time in the history of man as evil as the times that we live in. That's a fact. And I'm not talking about what you're reading in the newspaper. I'm not talking about what you're hearing from our so-called president or other politicians or the media, Facebook, or any of the rest of it. Of course, that's all stupid, it's all ugly, it's all nasty, but it is nothing compared to the truth. And in fact, even only God knows the depth of this degradation and darkness that has invaded this realm. And that's the reason we're here, ultimately. We've thought it was about a lot of things, but the truth is we're here to bring light the darkness and what that cost will be I'm not sure but I've given myself to whatever that cost is I'm willing to pay it and I have a feeling 
without going into a lot of detail, that we will pay it. And we were chosen for a time such as this. And the fact that we were chosen for a time such as this tells me that we're equipped to handle whatever we have to handle. We've been in training all of our Christian life, whether we knew it or not. We've been through boot camp. We've been through infantry training. We've been through advanced infantry training. And we're about to be dropped into the enemy's camp. So get ready to use every weapon you've been trained with. Because it's the only way we're going to defeat the enemy. But I can tell you this, even if the weapons fail, our leader won't. Even if the courage of those carrying the weapons fail, our leader won't. We will be successful. I may not be standing there when the final battle is fought and the flag is waved over the enemy, but I'll be counted with those who have the victory. And so will you if you're a believer. Our job now is to recruit. And that's the job we have until the Lord comes, is recruit and equip. Because there's going to be many battles until the final battle. And sometimes, if you're in some of those battles, they'll seem like they are the end battle. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. The battle you're in is the biggest battle because right. you're in it. But it doesn't mean it's the only battle, and it doesn't mean it's the last battle. It just means you're hap you happen to be in this one. Yep. So, again, I just, I, I, I'm not saying this to cause you to be fearful. We are in the end times. Whether these are the very end times, I don't know. I just know that they very well could be because of the evil that's taking place in the earth. Things that I never dreamed could happen in this country. And to be quite honest with you, the evil that's taking place in this country is as bad or worse than it is anywhere on the planet. It's just hidden. It's in darkness. But the light's going to shine on it, and it will be revealed, and when it is, people are going to be totally freaked out. So we need to be prepared now and for when that exposing and revealing takes place. Because if you think people are hungry for God now with the chaos that we're dealing with, with COVID and the, you know, the, the trying to divide us as races and, and uh, you know, the, the whole homosexual agenda and uh, transgender and all the other craziness that's taken place. It's nothing. That is really a very small portion of what this junk is really all about. Those things are more of distractions than they are yeah. the issue, but nevertheless, they are issues. But if those things are causing people to turn to the Lord, I promise you, when the whole truth comes out, it will just basically be a dividing line. You're either for or against. And right now, there's demonic forces at work in every area of our culture. And so I'm going to talk to you. I'm just going to give you what the Lord has has. Uh, given me and you can apply it however you want to praise the Lord but I want to start in Isaiah chapter uh, I'm going to read a pretty lengthy portion here of Isaiah I'd like to read Isaiah chapter 8 uh, verse 5 through Isaiah 9 7 praise the Lord and uh, as is usually the case I'm random I'll be all over the place because that's just the way my head works. Praise God. It's called uh, divine, 
dysfunction, I think. I don't know. That's the word. But I mean, God speaks to me the way I understand, <clears throat> and I understand kind of in a random way. And uh, they usually it, it usually ends up making sense to me. Whether it does to anybody else, I never know. I'm the one God put here, so I guess you just have to deal with it for the time being at least. Praise the Lord. But in Isaiah chapter 8, beginning at verse 5, it says, The Lord spake also unto me again, saying, Now remember in the scripture there's, uh, there's Old Testament especially, it's natural, physical things that are taking place. They have spiritual relevance, obviously, or they wouldn't be in the Bible. But they're also types and shadows of things to come. And I can't read the Old Testament anymore without seeing us and things that are going on today. Now, it may not be a perfect uh, metaphor or perfect analogy, but there's enough there to understand. If you're paying any attention, you'll grasp what God is trying to say to us today. And the Lord gave me this. This wasn't even part of my message. And, and then the Lord gave me this the other morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning. It just came, and I, started, I went back and started reading it. And I'm thinking, what the heck has this got to do with anything? And the Lord said, just read it. And so I did. But he said, for as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh. That, that word Shiloh is talking about the, the fountains of living water. And he said, now listen, just, let's just see us. Now, I'm not talking about you personally, but I'm talking about our nation, our culture, where we're, le where we're at today, this, this country. Because God's dealing with Israel, and not everybody in Israel is a jerk. But enough of them are jerks that God's got to have to do something about it. And so he's writing this uh, through the prophet Isaiah, is speaking to the people, and he says, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh, or they're refusing the living waters, they're refusing God as their source, right? That go softly and rejoice with Rezin and Remaliah's son. Rem Rezin and Remaliah represent government, the, the natural leaders. So they're giving up God's leadership and accepting humans' leadership. Imagine we're giving up God Almighty for Joe Biden. If that doesn't make you nervous, yeah. nothing else I say this morning will. And I don't really care about politics. I'm not choosing sides. I'm just saying if you want to be offended because I talk about Joe Biden, go ahead, but you'll be offended then when I talk about Republicans that are just as crooked and screwed up as anybody else is. Yeah, it's, true. it's government is corrupt. Yes. It's corrupt because it's filled with people that are unsaved for the most part, who are more demonic than they are godly. Some demon-possessed, others yes. just idiots that are being manipulated by evil spirits. Yes. But now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river strong and many, even the king of Assyria. He's just talking about armies here. River, waters, humans. And all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck and the stretching out of his wings. In other words, he's talking about he's going he's to uh, extend his power. Yeah. The stretching out of his wings. Talking about God now. There's, he's saying there's all kinds of crap coming against you. You can call it armies. Demonic is what I'm saying they are. Yeah. They're evil forces that are coming against us. And they're in this nation. And they're wanting to over, totally overrun this nation yeah. and overwhelm it. And he said, you're looking at human leadership for the answer. And believe me, they're not the answer. They're part of the problem. Yes. But he's telling us, I'm going I'm to extend my reach. Amen. And I'm going to uh, fill the breadth of the land. Oh, Emmanuel. Yes. Associate yourselves, oh, ye people. And ye shall be broken in pieces, he said, pick a side. Yeah. And give ear. All of ye are far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Three times he says it, that's perfect in God's mind. Yeah. 
So he's not messing around here. He's telling you what's going to happen if you pick the wrong side. Yes. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Hold all the meetings you want. G5, I don't care, G6, G10, G50, G1000. It doesn't matter how many of these little groups you have get together and make decisions. Amen. They're not going to come to anything. Right. Speak the word, and it shall not stand. Mm -hmm. Make your declarations. Right. Do your threats. Right. For God is with us. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me. With a strong hand. In other words, he's saying he emphatically told me this. That I should not walk in the way of this people. Right. Saying, say ye not a confederacy or a, an agreement to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear nor be afraid. They're saying either be a part of us or you got big problems. And the God said to me emphatically, do not be a part of them. I don't care how they try to intimidate you, how much they try to frighten you, how fearful you might even become. Do not join up. No way. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself or set him apart. Set him on high yes. and let him be your fear. Mm -hmm. Let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's a sanctuary for us. Yes. He's a stumbling block for them. Yes. He's a snare, a trap. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. Stand on the word of God. Yes. I'm telling you, people in this nation are going to hate you before this is over. Yes. If they don't already. Yes. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob. And I will look for him. Amen. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders. This is the prophet speaking. That's what we're here for. We're here for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? There's demonic worship to a degree that you cannot believe in this country. Right. And it has many different names, right. but it's the same devil. And they may be peeping and popping and doing all they're doing, but I'm telling you, they don't know Sikkim. No. What they do know is a lie. And they have bought into the lie, and they're in for one hell of a rude awakening. I and I use that term purposefully. Right. Yep. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, any word that's going to deviate from the word of God is going to bring you problems. And we better start disciplining yourselves to say only what God says. Because there is no light in them. None. Not a little bit. Not, you know, some that you might get something out of. There is no light. Do not listen. They shall pass through it hardly bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. Mm. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Mm. Nevertheless, I love that word. Yeah. Nevertheless. The dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Yes. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Yes. 
Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. My God is a consuming fire. And for unto us, for unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. And the government, every government, the government, the only government, amen, shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Yeah, go ahead and give him a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's go to Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And I'm going to come back to verse 18 in just a minute. Remember, we were, we've were we learned some things in uh, Bible study. It was talking about sowing and reaping. Well, we've all known that to some degree, not to the extent that we've been learning more about it. But we know that we're going to reap what we've sown and that there is a harvest coming. Amen. And there's a, there's a literal ongoing harvest as well as the ultimate harvest. But he says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, Holy, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So if you can go back to 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Now he's being resurrected, and he's leaving, right? Now he, he took our harvest. Right? The punishment for our sin was our harvest, death, destruction, everything. But Jesus took that, and we get his harvest. What's his harvest? All power. Yeah. That's our harvest. Yes. If we understand the truth, we have all power. It belongs to us. Praise the Lord. Now let's go to John chapter 10 and verse 10. So our harvest is all power. Well, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he said, Jesus said, I'm coming that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So what's the enemy trying to steal? All power. Yeah. That's what he's been after from day one. Yeah. From his fall from heaven. He wants God power. He wants to control. He wants to rule. Men. He wants above mankind. So there's this kind of dualism in the world that accounts for, for most of the persecutions that we deal with as believers and have dealt with ever since the days of Cain and Abel. Right. Nothing new under the sun. There are two spirits in the earth, the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan, and they are eternal in terms of their warfare. In eternal enmity between God and the devil. Amen. War. Warfare. From the moment that Satan fell, there has been war between God and Satan. Right. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Part of what's going to be exposed is the fact that much of our government, much of our uh, media, internet, all this kind of stuff, is controlled by the enemy. We're not at war with these people. These people are ignorance personified. They're just stupidity in a human form. And they're being manipulated by the devil. My battle is not with the individuals running these things, although it's hard not to get caught up in that. My battle is with that demonic spirit behind them that they are either possessed of or controlled by. And that goes with our president all the way down. Yes, it does. To school boards. Yes. To city councils. To mayors, to governors, to, to congress, to senators. It's, it's, it's pervasive. I'm not saying everyone is. I'm just saying far more are than are not. And you don't have to check out their background very long to find out. What I'm telling you is the truth. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Thank God for Governor Reynolds. You can think what you like, but I'm telling you, that woman has stood up for righteousness, even though she may not understand all of it, but she's taken some stands that are courageous, and she's taken stands that are anti-demonic, against the wiles of the enemy, against what the devil is trying to you know, incorporate into our lives. The cause of religious hatred may be almost anything. It doesn't take much. But the true cause is nearly always the same. The ancient animosity that Satan has towards God and his kingdom ever since his fall. Satan is consumed with a desire, with a lust He's obsessed with the ultimate domination over humanity. And whenever that obsession, whenever that ambition is challenged by God, by the Spirit of God, savage fury erupts. You can look throughout history. You uh, Just read the Bible. The world hated Jesus. And they hated him without a cause. In spite of all of their charges against him, his contemporaries, Christ's contemporaries, could find nothing in either his doctrine or his deeds to cause them such rage, such hatred, as they constantly displayed towards him. It was demonic. It was spiritual warfare. And nothing, I repeat, nothing has changed. Acts chapter 3, verse 13 through 15. For the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Pilate, even this heathen, Gentile wanted to let him go, and the religious people wouldn't let him let him go. Their hatred was so powerful, so strong. You denied the Holy One and the just, and you desired a murderer to be granted to you. And kill the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. They hated him. Not for anything he said, not for anything that he did, but for who and what he was. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you don't know the world hates you, you're about to find out that it does. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, 
but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's what this crap is all about, to divide, to get everybody in a place where who everybody knows who's on whose side. And the, month, the moment you have been identified, I'm telling you, you're going to be hated like you've never been hated before. Yep. Because the battle lines are being drawn. Yep. Because of this eternal hatred of the enemy against God. Yep. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. So you're going to know who's of God and who isn't. If they hate you and do everything they can to destroy you, they're probably the enemy. Yeah. But if they listen to the things you say and go, wow, I never knew, then you can bet that there's somebody who has an opportunity to be born again, to be a part of the family of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's the spirit of Christ in us that draws Satan's hatred. Not us. It's his spirit. He could care less about us, to be quite honest. We're just in the way. It's God that he hates. And the fact that we have God in us, he hates us. And so, therefore, those that are under his control, under his influence, are going to hate us as well. The ungodly the demon-possessed, the oppressed. They're all around us, folks. People of the world. They don't care what you believe. They just stare, you know, like a cow at a new gate. Blank when it comes to our religious practices. It means nothing to them. But there's one thing they will never forgive us. The presence of God's spirit in us. I, I'm just saying. The days of thinking this is summer Bible school are over. What everything has been leading up to for nearly 6,000 years is coming to its climax. And guess what, lucky you? You get to be part of it. Now, here's the good news. You wouldn't be here if God hadn't equipped you for the battle. This is literally a Hadassah moment. Chosen for a time such as this. Tim's always talking about it, and he's absolutely true. It's not an accident that we're born when we were born. Because we could have been born any time. But we weren't. We were born for this. These people, these possessed, these oppressed, these manipulated, these controlled, they may not know the cause of that strange feeling of antagonism that comes up in them whenever they're around us. One of us. Any of us. But it's real. And believe me, it's dangerous. Satan is never going to stop making war on the man-child. The person that the Spirit of Christ dwells in. And that means we're going to have to continue to be the target of his attacks. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 10, verse 6 and 7. I preached a message from this 30 years ago, maybe 35, I don't know. It was when I, when I, one of the first few messages I ever preached, and I had no idea where it came from, but it makes more sense to me now than it ever did, and maybe that's why. A lot of things I preached, uh, the whole Isaiah 54 thing, never even knew where Isaiah 54 was or if there was one when God gave it to me. I was praying in my daughter's bedroom in Viter, Texas, and uh, had had the Holy Ghost maybe a year, struggling with 
thinking God's calling me to preach and knowing what my history was and thinking that's got to be, you've got to be nuts. This has got to be the devil doing this. And God giving me things that made no sense to me because I didn't know anything about the Bible other than Jesus loves me, this I know. That was about the limit. For God so loved the world. That was it. John 6, 316. That's about all I knew. And yet God was giving me stuff that I wouldn't even recognize for another 40 years. And now it's coming back, and now I know why. Because God really wasn't that interested in the pre previous 35. I mean, he protected me, he provided for me, he took care of me. But it was all for a time like this. It was for this. Not for all the rest of it. The rest of it was just for me to get to here. Folly was set. Oh, God, give me a minute here because I'm feeling it. Praise the Lord. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich set in low places. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. <laughs> you know, in the old days, they crowned the king and they tied a, a cap and a bell on the court fool. Today we crown the fool and tie a tin can on the king. Woo. Praise God. The court fool, he was a jester, a comedian. And that ancient jester, or fool as he was described, was at best treated like a house pet. Or at worst, he was kicked and beaten because of humor or his wit was too pointed or because he couldn't come up with the thing to say that the, the royalty wanted to hear. And seeing that we're humans, created in the image of God, and we have the Spirit of God living in us, I've come to the conclusion that I'd rather be a serious-minded dolt concerned about eternal life than a paid pet with nothing better to do than to make some phony, evil leader happy by doing whatever he asked me to do. And then forget that he's going to die and come to judgment. He needs my prayers as much as I don't want to make them. Nathan does not want to pray for him. But the Jesus in me will not stop praying. Romans 1, 17 through 22. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, if you may not have had to for the last 20 years, but you sure will now. Before this is over, you're going to have to, so you just as well get started. The just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The truth is today, what's supposed to be a civilized society <laughs> the real court fool who wears the crown, who rules over millions of minds, subjects who who want nothing more, nothing higher, nothing better than to be lied to. 
to me made to feel like, well, everything will be all right if you just get the shot, if you just wear a mask, if you just stay away from each other, if you just don't have church, if you just quit trusting your God and trust us. We've got the answers. We have science on our side. And the fact that this idiot and his witty little sayings that he doesn't remember 10 seconds later, his words are all written for him by somebody else. From a script that he has even trouble reading. But somehow that doesn't seem to tarnish his crown in the eyes of most of his subjects. They just go, oh, that's Uncle Joe. Isn't he sweet? No, he's a moron with a demonic spirit manipulating him. I said, I don't care. Your politics mean absolutely nothing to me. Mine should mean nothing to you. This isn't about politics. This is about good and evil. This is about light and darkness. This clown still takes his tribute from the masses who would rather be lied to with a smile on their face when the kingdom is crashing down all around them. Yeah, we've crowned the fool and we've spurned the real kings among us. And unless the real kings rise up boldly and begin to rebuild the kingdom, we're going to find ourselves living in exile or in ruins, one of the two. Psalms 137, 1 through 7. This is no time for cowards. I'm telling you the truth. You can think I'm just being uh, overreactive or whatever, but I'm not telling you half of what I could be telling you. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion. That's where a lot of church is right now. They're just sitting around weeping, crying somewhere in their basement. And what do you think that's going to do? Nothing but in, get you in. Yep. Therapy. <laughs> we hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. We want you to be happy. Come on, get the shot. You'll be happy. You won't have to worry about anything anymore. Everything will be good. Except you'll have to wear a mask that you didn't have to wear until you got the shot. You never knew I could be this political, do you? I never talk about crap like this. I never do. You can, people have known me for years and years. No, I've ne I never talk about politics. I never talk about my beliefs or faith in, in people and in individuals. But I'm telling you, we're at the point now where all that's, I, I'm tired of being polite and just trying not to hurt somebody's feelings. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but if they get hurt, get over it. Kathy required of us a song that they wasted us, required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in the strange land? I'm thinking I saw a flashpoint. I think it was they were, they were interviewing a, a, a preacher from Canada who had been thrown in jail for having church. And when they locked him up, they'd come over to him and say, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. While he's sitting in the jail. 
Now, if that isn't the devil trying to yeah. thumb his nose at somebody, I don't know what is. It made me furious. Yeah. And I had more respect for that pastor after that than I ever had before because he just said, God loves you guys. You know that, don't you? I got a feeling I might have been sharing a few <laughs> expletives that I would have later had to repent of that it would have made me feel really good for a moment or two. I forget the old, if I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. In other words, burn it down. Amen. What have we been watching for the last year and a half? Amen. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day, burn it, burn it up. It's just America. It's corrupt. It's no good. It's lousy. It's disgusting. We've only had a few million men and women die for it. Well, so what? children of God had every reason to believe that their days as a nation were over and that they were a people forgotten of God. But God being the God that he is, he sent a prophet. Look at Isaiah 49, verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me. My Lord hath forgotten me. There are a lot of people feeling that way. Christians. Yeah. Believers. Zechariah 8, verse 3 through 9. How many of you know Zechariah is a prophet? So God sends a prophet because that's where everybody's head is. Oh, no, it's all over. We're done. So he sends Zechariah, and Zechariah says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women, that makes me feel better, praise the Lord, dwell in the streets of Jerusalem. And every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Hallelujah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of this people, in these days should it also be marvelous in my eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. And I will bring them. And they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. We are the temple of the living God. Zechariah. It's a Hebrew name, name. And that name literally is Zechariah. Yah means God. And Zechar means has remembered. So when God's people thought God had forgotten them, God sent them a man whose given name was God has remembered. In the days of their discouragement, God sent a messenger. God has remembered. It wasn't only what Zechariah said. It's what he was. Every word of encouragement came from that God has remembered. He remembered his promise. He remembered his love. He remembered his mercy. He remembered his people. He wouldn't give up on them. They would be restored. I'm talking to people right now. Maybe you're on the Internet. I'm sorry if I hadn't acknowledged you, but it got a little crazy here to begin with. 
So hopefully you saw that and can understand why I didn't greet you. But everybody who's fallen, everybody who's ever failed, everybody who's ever sinned, everybody who's ever wondered and asked, God, have you forgotten me? Because of something I did, something I said, something I didn't do, something I wished I would have done, something I did wrong. Remember this one. His name, Zechariah. And what it tells you is God will never forget you. God will never forget us. He won't forget his faithfulness, even when we have been unfaithful. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 44 through 50. I'm telling you, we're living in scary times, but what I'm trying to get across to you is God saying, don't be scared. You can live in times of fear and not be afraid. And the Philistine said to David, come to me. And I'll give your flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you're coming to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. You got some stuff. But I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, yes. the God of the armies yes. of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Yes. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I'll give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward yes. the army to meet the Philistine. Jesus. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone, slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. And he smote the Philistine and slew him. And there wasn't even a sword in his hand. Now, I hope you don't misunderstand me. If you've been vaccinated, God bless you. But if you're holding out, like myself and some others, if some idiot comes knocking on your door, yeah. just smile and say, I'm not interested. I have an inoculation already. Yeah. It's called the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And it'll fight any germ that the enemy can send my way. Praise God. I've been washed in that blood. I've had a Jesus transfusion. And your COVID-19 don't scare me one bit. Now, if you're afraid, maybe you should get a booster just in case you come into contact with me sometime at Menards and I'm not wearing a mask. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If I don't get emails for this, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> the Lord. But before you go to the trouble of sending it, I don't care, and I don't read half of them anyway because I can't even pull them up. <laughs> Sometimes ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So here's the deal. David used one thing to defeat this enemy, a name. The enemy had all kinds of weapons, had a huge army behind him, had somebody even standing in front of him to protect him, you know, his armor bearer. David had nothing. He had a name and a little rock. And he prevailed. David even had an idiot for a king. He had a fool for a king. But David wasn't fighting for the king. 
He was fighting for his God and the people of Israel. And that's what we got to keep reminding ourselves. I love this country, but I'm not fighting for this country. I'm fighting for me, mine, and the house of God, the family of God. Amen. My God is my king. Hallelujah. What made David run? Maybe David's greatness, maybe his significance really lies in his complete preoccupation with God. He was a Jew. Now, I'm saying this not to brag on myself. I'm saying it because it shocks me. I'm totally preoccupied with God, have been for months now. Now, I've always loved the Lord. I mean, ever since I come to know him and was born again and received baptism in the Holy Spirit. But, but I, could, I could enjoy any number of other things, and believe me, I have. But for whatever reason, not much else interests me. I mean, I still enjoy the grandkids mm, to a point, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I love my grandkids. You, you see me. I, I, they're great. And I enjoy watching them come over and they swim. And they do the different things and play around the yard and have great times. And they're just fun. They're kids. They're, they're innocent. They're, you know, make you feel good. Yeah. feel that way about all kids. But anyway. This is, a, this is a weird time. And God, and this is what's so cool. And I, I, I reminded the Lord again this morning when he woke me up. I said, Lord, this isn't me. This is you. Here's what Tammy was saying to some degree. I, I, I've never been, what do you, I don't know the word, uh, hyper-spiritual. I mean, I've loved the Lord, and I've, I've tried to be obedient and do whatever he asked me to do, but, but I still just kind of went life and did my stuff, too. And, but this dedication, this concentration, it came from him. It didn't come from me. I, I just one day got up and didn't want to do the other stuff anymore. So I'm not judging anybody else that's still kind of going through this, you know, the stuff in life, and that. I'm not... I'm not saying I'm better or I'm not I'm just saying if you're looking at me and saying well how come you're acting this way who do you think you are I, I don't know I'm doing this because it's God doing it I'm, it isn't because I sat down one day and said bless God I'm going to make a decision I'm not doing anything like that again and I'll never say that and I'll never do that I'm not perfect I'm still you know I got issues but I'm saying the things that used to yeah. capture my attention don't and it's God. It isn't me. It isn't like I turned over a new leaf. So David had this preoccupation. And it's, in a way, I, I, I can identify, you know. He, he was a Jew. He was taught in the Levitical tradition. I mean, I was taught in the holiness Pentecostal tradition. It's about as close to being a Hasidic Jew as you can get. Amen. I'm telling you. And I'm not, I'm not being hateful to it. Thank God for him because it, it brought me lots of revelation and made good friends. And I was an ordained in the organization. I mean, I was licensed to preach and ordained in the United Pentecostal Church. Still have friends. Few. Some have Praise the Lord. Some of them prophesied my death years ago. I'm not kidding, but it's hallelujah. Uh, anyway, I'm just saying. He was a Jew, so I, I kind of I can relate in a way, you know. And I don't mean this arrogantly, but he was a Jew. He was taught in all this Levitical tradition, but he never lost. He never got lost in the forms of religion, and that's one of the reasons why I left because. Just could not conform. I wasn't doing sinful things. I wasn't being a sinner. I just 
could not preach some things that were not biblically true. They weren't heaven and hell issues. And people got angry and, and frustrated, and so I just said, you know what, I'm not signing the thing again. I'm just, it's fine. They didn't kick me out. I just chose not to re-up, praise the Lord. So look at Psalms chapter 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So I've set the Lord before me. And because he's always at my right hand, I'm not going to be moved by the crap that's going on around me. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So David was acutely God conscious. David was a God possessed man. And because he was a God possessed person, he could be God taught. David knew God. But again, I identify. He knew him with this easy kind of familiarity. And I have that with God. And I don't mean disrespectfully because I, I mean, I'm reverential and I'm sanctified, I think. I mean, but I'm not intimidated. I mean, God hasn't made me afraid to come and just talk to him about stuff. Thank God, because I've had a lot of stuff to talk to him about over the years. David knew God. He knew him with this, this, like I said, this easy kind of familiarity. And yet he still honored him. He still was in awe of him. So what made David run? Well, I thought about this. Watching the kids the other day, Tuesday, when they were over to swim, we had uh, a bunch of grandkids. I mean, I don't know how they all get in the pool, to be quite honest with you, but they manage. <laughs> but what makes a little kid run and laugh and play on a summer morning? Just, you watch them, and they're just, they're just as happy. They're so dumb, they're happy. They're like little drunks. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they just do stuff and without thinking of what the consequence might be. And, you know, they're trying to dive into a four-foot pool. Yeah. And I tell them, don't do that. You'll break your neck. And I say, oh, no, no you won't. You won't. Just, just don't do that. <laughs> okay. Gee, like that. I'm thinking, what have they been drinking? What did Sally give them for breakfast? Bloody Marys? I mean, they're like six and five. and They're like little drunks. But David was God intoxicated. He gazed on God until he was so full of him that he couldn't contain himself. He, he danced before the ark, before the presence of God, like a crazy man, like a drunken kid. And it delighted God yes. almost as much as it outraged his wife. Yes. <laughs> Somehow David, and here's what I discovered. Somehow by the Spirit, David was prophetic. And though he did, was not filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost had to have been talking to him a lot. Because he was moving in prophetic ways that nobody else did. And his, re his relationship with God was almost like it was New Testament or New Covenant. Yeah. And somehow he, in the spirit, he knew and he communicated with the one who was going to become his son according to the flesh. The one that was declared to be the son of God. Look at Romans 1, verses 3 and 4. In 
concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So David somehow saw Jesus would be his son. Somehow he had this understanding that God, in some weird way, was going to become his child or his progenitor. And it was the love of Christ, the love of God, that made David run. This conflict between my little offspring and God Almighty. If that didn't make you, if that won't make you drunk, if that wouldn't get you messed up, if that wouldn't cause you to do some crazy stuff, I don't know what would. David saw prophetically into the future. And of course, he was a Hebrew. So I'm going to teach you a Hebrew sentence. It's the only one I know, so I don't expect it. Although I take that back, I know a couple, but they don't amount to much. But I'm going to teach you a sentence, one sentence. And it was one that David knew and one that he understood. Just one sentence. The Hebrew word for with is im. We would spell it E-E-M, im. And the word for us is anu. Im anu. With us. And the word for God is el. So how do you say with us, God? Im anu el. Im anu el. Emmanuel. God with us. In Hebrew, see, it's more than a name. That's the sad part about translating Hebrew into English, or it never quite hits everything that we want it to hit. To us, it's a name. In Hebrew, it's actually a sentence, it's a declaration. A reality. Emmanuel. He came into this world. Into every circumstance. Into every situation. So that we could say. Im anu el. Im anu el. God is with us. In every place. In every moment. In every way. Always forever and that's what made David run and it'll do the same thing for us yeah. courage to run to the battle courage to stand when we're being threatened with do this or this consequence or don't do this and this is going to happen and courage to run to the battle, run to the enemy with confidence, with assurance of victory. We come in the name of our God and with our God. Im anu el. He's not just with me. He's in me. I'm not just carrying a name. I'm carrying the reality of God Almighty. What in the world have I got to be afraid of? The worst that can happen is the best that can happen. He remembers us. Zakaria. He remembers us. We are engraven on the palms of his hands. We are not servants. We are not fools. We are kings. Kings and priests unto God. There's two spirits in the world, but there's only one God. And he's with us. And he is for us. Im Anuel, the one who already defeated the enemy. 
the one begotten of David in the flesh and the one raised from the dead by our God. Our Father is expecting the the same things from us, his offspring, his children. Let's close with this, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 through 23. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Hallelujah. He has promised us his harvest, total victory, all power. In Anu El. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ, and we have nothing to fear. Amen. If our fear is in God, everything else has to bow its knee. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I expect that we're going to be the bravest, the most bold, the most outspoken for Jesus because they already hate you. You're not going to make an enemy. You might just win a convert to Jesus Christ. Amen. Ron, would you come and take up the offering? He thank you for raising that. Praise God. We've got absolutely nothing to fear. We just have to stand. God is going to take care of us. He's going to take care of our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. The good thing about them is if he were to come and rapture us out of here, which I don't really think is going to happen immediately, so don't, you know, get preoccupied with that. I'd be all right with it, but I'm just saying. Uh, if that were to be the case, these kids are guaranteed. They've got a stamp of approval. They've already got their ticket punched, man. I mean, they're, they're righteous in the eyes of God. They're pure. I know that's difficult for parents to, and grandparents sometimes to say, well, okay, yeah, yeah, because well, we're thinking, oh, wow, I don't know about that one. They, they may need a little. <laughs> no, nah, they're good. Yeah. But the beauty of it is, so are you. Because he looks at us in the very same way. Amen. Amen? Innocent. Like Adam and Eve were before there was any laws or any rules or anything else. Just simply innocent in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. All power. Go. Be, be, Be arrogant. I mean, just try that for a while. Amen? Pray, Ron.
Amen. God bless you as you give. If anybody uh, still would like prayer, if you didn't come up earlier and you feel like God's speaking to you or has spoken to you and you, and you would like prayer or even someone to agree with you in prayer, well, come on up and uh, Suzanne, someone, anybody can uh, be happy, would be happy to pray for you and speak a word from the Lord yeah. in Jesus' name. Yes. Everybody remember a girl named Tammy. Their prayers, the battling with breast cancer, that kind of thing. It really scared me. Uh, a friend asked me to pray for her. Yes. I what? told her I'd put it to the church. Yeah. Cammy? Nothing but. Yeah. Total healing. Yeah. Cammy. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's just agree together right now for Cammy. God knows yeah. the situation. Oh. Father, we just rebuke this cancer. We declare a total healing and deliverance from the enemy, from the lies of the devil. Amen. No weapon formed against her will prosper. We bind together as a as a ring of God's protection and provision for this woman, Cami, and that God, you would just rebuke the enemy, the devil that carries that cancer, and strip him, Lord, of that cancer away from her. Take it from her, Lord, and rebuke. Take it back to the pits of hell where it belongs. We just declare that her next report will be a positive yes. report, that she will be clear and clean of cancer, yes. that she'll be delivered in Jesus' name, live a long and fruitful life for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Amen. Now, if anybody would like prayer or you feel like God may have a word for you, Suzanne's right there. She'd be happy to pray with you and uh, speak to you whatever God speaks to her on your behalf. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you can be here for either or both of those, not only would you be a blessing to those who are putting their time and effort into this, but you would receive a blessing. I guarantee you. God shows up every time, and uh, it'll be a blessing for you. Praise God. Wednesday at 6.30, Friday at 7.